It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 276 of Science on Top. Today's Sunday, the 27th of August, 2017. I'm Ed Brown, and this week I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And on today's show, we'll be talking about plate tectonics, Mars's bow shock, mini organs, and Tabby's star. So let's start off with plate tectonics. It's such a young field, first proposed in 1912 by Alfred Wegener, but not seriously looked at until the late 1950s. And yet we have a really good understanding of it. But of course, we're always learning new things, and now one of the few remaining mysteries may have been solved. Penny, we now know how thick continental plates are. We do. And it's interesting you mentioned it's a young field. And to put that in perspective, like evolution, the idea of that is over 150 years old now. When my mum was at uni, some lecturer said to her, Oh, yeah, there's this crazy theory of plate tectonics. Ha, ha, ha. Don't worry about that. But just thought I'd let you know it was out there, you mm-hmm. know, and she was taught something different. So it is very, very young. And like you said, it's amazing how much we know, but also how much we don't know yet. So this um, study is quite interesting about the depth of continental plates. There's two different kinds of... Well, not two different kinds of plates, but two different kinds of crust, continental crust and oceanic crust. And um, if you think about Australia, for example, the plate that Australia is on is not the same as the continent of Australia. So there's essentially a really thick, dense, low bit of oceanic crust and then this continental crust of lighter sort of not fluffy, but a lot lighter, <laughs> lighter rocks. Fluffy um, rocks. Gotcha. Fluffy rocks. <laughs> relatively fluffy in, in, in a way that granite is quite a fluffy rock, you know. <laughs> That's just how I think of it. I, I um, like it. Again, like you have to imagine this without any ocean in the world. So this has nothing to do with water. Mm-hmm. You would still be able to see if you could see it. There's two distinct different kind of rocks, the continental bit of Australia and its oceanic crust around it, all on the same plate. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, not every continent is sitting in the middle of a plate in splendid isolation, but that's just an example of the different kinds of crusts. So as well as these two different kinds of crust, the two different kinds of rock, the earth also has different layers. So when you're at school, you probably drew a picture of the earth and you drew the crust on the outside, um, the mantle in red underneath and the core in the middle. Mm-hmm. And these layers are the different kinds of chemistry or the different minerals that are found in the earth. So the iron, for example, is made of, um, the, sorry, the core, for example, is made of like iron and nickel and the crust is made of all the minerals that we know and so on. But, The earth is also divided into different layers in terms of how it behaves and how hot and how plastic the rocks are. So you have the lithosphere, which is the the dry, stable cracking bit on the top, and the asthenosphere, which is more plastic kind of rocks. And in the um, article that I read, um, Sintai Lee has described this really nicely, a geologist at Rice University, as like imagine a hot fudge brownie. So if you poke it at first, it's all liquid. But as it cools, it has that crusty layer on the top, but still it has some gooey stuff underneath. So that's sort of what's happening with the, um, the earth. So the tectonic plates up the top, are what we would call the lithosphere, and they're almost floating on this asthenosphere because over millions and millions of years it moves around. So where I really want brownies now. I know. know. (laughs) You just made me hungry. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I know, exactly. Some delicious continental crust. (laughs) 
And I guess, you know, we use that word crust. I guess it is like a that baking metaphor is something that we understand, like the surface or the crust of it. Anyway, so what this um, study has done is tried to find where the boundary of the lithosphere is. And remember, that's not necessarily the same as the chemistry. So estimating it by looking at um, diamonds that come from deep volcanoes can give you one kind of answer. Looking at seismic waves moving through the earth has given a different um, answer. So funnily enough, we can't go into the earth to, well, not funnily enough, we can't go into the earth to see this. So there's two different data sources which have been a bit conflicting. But this latest paper reconciles those findings. It uses um, high-resolution data from seismic waves from every single continent to uh, estimate the edge of the lithosphere. And they're looking in the middle of plates, not at the um, edges. Mm -hmm. And so what they found was that the um, lithosphere tends to be from about 130 kilometres to I think about 190, Mm -hmm. I think it's 80 to 120 miles below the surface. So that's really, I don't know. I just think that was interesting. It's not something I've ever really thought about what we do or what we don't, but it is really interesting to think we didn't know this and now we do. I think it's also interesting because we always talk about it being a thin crust. And so you sort of think, well, it's, it's maybe, you know, only a few kilometers deep, but it's actually, you know, 130 kilometers deep is a really thick crust in it really. Um, it's kind of hard to visualize it. It's about the height of 15 Mount Everest. Or if you've got 350 Empire State buildings, it'd be that. T- or 40,000 African elephants, really. Look, it's about, it's the length of <laughs> Delaware, okay, going down. That's, I hope we all know exactly how deep it is now. I've always pictured, though, the continents sort of floating in oceanic crust, but like an iceberg, you know. So whatever mm-hmm. you see, the Himalayas, yep. think about what's going on beneath the surface as well. Sure. Yeah. That's very cool. And so these seismic waves that they were measuring, they generated it or were they generated by earthquakes? No, no. So these were from um, earthquakes. Right. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I think that that would probably not be ethical to generate a magnitude (laughs) 5.5 earthquake, even if we Uh, can. But it's deep in the deep deep down in the crust. Yeah. It's fine. (laughs) Nothing could could possibly go wrong. Very good point. Uh, It's it's great to just have another puzzle, uh, another piece in that puzzle there, which is very cool. Uh, All right. Let's move on to some Mars news now. And the Mars Express Orbiter, which is the second longest surviving continually active spacecraft in orbit around a planet other than Earth. And it's been orbiting Mars since 2003. And some of the data it collected has been used by a team of European scientists to determine that Mars's bow shock shifts due to changes in the planet's atmosphere. Lucas, let's pull back and first determine what a bow shock is. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a bow shock is the the name given to the boundary of interaction between a planet or other celestial bodies, um, uh, atmospheric or exospheric uh, interaction with the solar wind. Um, so, if you imagine like a boat going through water, you, you have uh, this sort of bow wave that falls in front of a boat. And that's, that's sort of where, the, where the, uh, the term gets its name from. It's a similar sort of scenario as the, as the solar winds hitting or, you know, streaming towards the, the planet or moon or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you end up with this, this kind of bow wave firm, forming at the, at the leading edge, uh, the edge, you know, uh, facing in towards the, uh, the star. So in the case of Earth, we have a, a fairly large, you know, bow shock, which is um, a very complex interaction between the Earth's magnetosphere. So that's that's kind of the the main part of the Earth's um, uh, direct influence on its surroundings, which which uh, impacts upon the, uh, um, the this interaction with the solar wind. And of course, this is you know, partially what's due, what causes our um, very cool. 
uh, Aurora uh, Borealis or Australis, depending on which which you know side of the planet you're on, which you know pole you're, you're nearest to. Um, so it's that magnetosphere and then uh, interactions between um, charged particles in the solar winds with our ionosphere, which is a you know quite a, a high uh, layer within our atmosphere, which which then basically causes the the uh, ionization of those particles and then the you know distinctive glow. So in the case of Mars, sorry, go on. So the bow shock is where this, these charged particles coming from the sun hit the magnetic field of the Earth and then split around the Earth. Is that uh, how you? Pretty describe? much. It's not just the magnetic field, but yes, in the in the case of the Earth, it's primarily the the magnetic sphere that that causes this um, this disruption to the to the solar wind. Um, and, and sort of changes its directions, but it, um, some of those particles make it to the ionosphere as well. So it's it's quite complex. And in fact, in the story that I assume you'll include uh, in the show notes, the link to this story on um, Universe Today, it, there's a there are two diagrams, a pair of, of illustrations showing the Earth's interaction with the solar wind versus Mars' interaction mm-hmm. with the solar wind. And you can see that Mer- Earth's interaction is very complex because of these very, very complex you know, loops of magnetic fields that Earth has. Unlike Mars, which has a very, very weak magnetic field, um, it's felt that the, uh, as, as Penny was just mentioning in the previous story, with the, the big, you know, we've got this, this core of Earth, which is believed to be a, uh, basically a dynamo, a spinning, um, you know, a s- sphere of, of partially molten um, metal. Uh, that, you know, when you, when you spin metal, you, you basically create magnetic fields, and that's, that's what's felt is maintains our magnetic field. But in the case of Mars, and its uh, characteristically low um, uh, plate tectonics. Uh, it's, it's, it has basically two atmospheres from memory, and like a two, sorry, not two atmospheres, two hemispheres. One of which is dominated by Olympus Mons, which is this massive, you know, actually the largest in the in the solar system volcano, long long thought to be extinct. But the um, it doesn't have these these uh, plate tectonic features that we we see on Earth. Um, it's basically got sort of a fairly static crust. And part of the reason of this is it's felt that its, um, its mantle and, and, and all of the, the um, dynamics that, that occur in the mantle, which is this sort of broiling, bubbling, you know, um, uh, heat exchange that's constantly occurring, um, that doesn't seem to be uh, active in Mars, at least not anymore, and, qu- and certainly for not quite some time. Uh, and as a result, it doesn't have this, um, this plate tectonic features, but it also doesn't appear to have a, a, a much of a magnetosphere. It does have an atmosphere, but it's really, really thin, like about 1% of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. So it's a really weak, weak atmosphere. So where all of this leads us is we've, we've known for quite a long time that Mars has a bow shock, as indeed most celestial bodies do. Um, but we've we have seen with a variety of instruments over the years that Mars's bow shock seems to change. It has variation in it, which has not been fully explained uh, up until now, and possibly you know still isn't fully explained even with these uh, observations. These observations actually, to me, um, were very interesting because it shows that we tend to. I mean, you know how much I love. Um, deconstructing how we know what we know that's one of the things Absolutely. i love about uh, uh about astronomy but uh um th- this particular story also highlighted that there's a whole lot of factors that are believed involved in the in the variation of mars's bow shock one of them is is it has quite an elongated or- orbit it's um it, it can sort of range um in its uh, distance from the sun by a, 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 fair, a fairly significant amount basically it's it has a an orbit of um uh, it, it goes from about uh, 128, um, um, or let's go into kilometres, shall yeah. we? Uh, 206 uh, million kilometres to 249 million kilometres, depending on where that where it is in its in its orbit. Um, so you know, imagine you, you've you've got a, a planet that that does move quite a lot within that range, and and as a result of moving in that range. Um, there's a, a difference in the amount of solar radiation hitting, particularly the ultraviolet radiation. And this is one of the factors that, that um, this team are proposing is, is um, very much involved because 
they see that the change in the amount of solar radiation uh, hits the thin Mars atmosphere, changes the rate at which ions uh, and electrons uh, are produced in the upper atmosphere. And they, and they think this actually increases thermal pressure, which counteracts the incoming solar wind. So it's kind of like, it's almost like the solar wind pushes harder and therefore it pushes back more, which is, wow. which is kind of cool. And, and, and like, a, again, you, you, you think of, um, if I were to extrapolate this out to thinking of um, life in the universe and, and, you know, we know now that some, some of the uh, details of the Drake equation are starting to be filled in. This is the equation where you, um, that, that was proposed uh, by uh, Drake, who, who said, uh, Frank Drake, who said that, um, you know, let, let's figure out how likely there is to be life out there and he put together this equation but has all these different factors and a few of them are things like how many stars are there how many of those stars have got planets how many of those planets are in the habitable zone blah 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 and there's all these sort of parts of the Drake equation some of which we probably never figure out but um, it's interesting though that um, if you consider the likelihood of an atmosphere around a planet to be impacted by its ability to um, divert the solar winds, because this is something that's affected Mars and stripped away a lot of its atmosphere over, over the eons. Um, even now, with such a very low density atmosphere, uh, Mars is, you know, diverting some of those solar winds. So, you know, it's interesting to think about. That so anyway, it's really interesting because, as you say, it yeah. doesn't have that internal dynamo. It's not generating yeah. a magnetic field. So this must be all from just magnetic fields within the very thin atmosphere, I guess. Well, no, they, the magnetic fields, they don't, they don't think are playing much of a role in here. But, right, okay. but Mars does have an ionosphere, uh, right. which is a part of its, uh, its atmosphere and its exosphere, which is uh, basically think of an extended atmosphere that is slowly leaking. That's kind of what the exosphere mm -hmm. is in this, in this context. So uh, basically the, this study has, has, has added to the body of data about this. So they, they feel um, that they weren't able to draw any... Um, single conclusions from this. They couldn't say, okay, here's the smoking gun. It is this increase in UV uh, interactions, for example, that are, uh, that are contributing to the variation of the solar wind. Or it is because of the change in its orbit and the amount of other radiation hitting it. Or it is because of these cyclical changes in whatever, whatever. Basically, all of the different things that have been proposed in the past, such as even dust storms, um, dust storms on Mars are, are known to interact with the upper atmosphere and ionosphere of Mars. So, you know, as a result, there could be um, some, some link between uh, dust storms and bow shock location um, because they, they reach so high in the atmosphere. And bow shock means um, ionisation of gases. Sorry, the, the dust in the atmosphere could affect the ionisation of gases and so forth. So there's a whole lot of complex stuff going on there. But uh, I think what is interesting about this is it shows that... Um, uh, there is quite a there is potentially a, a direct correlation between distance from the sun in Mars's orbit and the UV radiation. As I say, it's this con this the scenario of uh, the solar wind pushing harder and Mars pushing back harder as a result, which is which is kind of cool. We do also have um, I think it's it's Maven NASA's. Um, orbiter uh, around Mars at the moment, which is doing a lot of atmospheric tests as well. Uh, I wonder if that might also be able to provide more data and uh, maybe these teams will work together to investigate this further. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that point's actually made in this story where they, um, the, the author has actually proposed, you know, mentioned that, um, uh, oh, sorry, Hall, the, 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 this, the lead of this study has mentioned that um, uh, joint you know, investigations by the Mars Express team and by NASA's Maven mission might actually uh, uh, help to to um, to figure out more about this. But yeah, it's uh, as I say, it was I, it, there were multiple things about this story that just sort of popped out of me as being quite interesting. Um, chief of which was I was actually a little bit surprised that that Mars even really still has a bow shock. Yeah, you know, I kind of I, I've known. I've known that it has very, very limited atmosphere and does not have a mag magnetosphere. So, you know, kind of just written it off as okay. Well, it's it's screwed because it's having all its, it's having you know all of its gases, all of all of its volatiles, you know, stripped off by the solar wind, 
which is why we think it's so barren and desolate now because over after eons of that happening any anything that you know doesn't stay in its state is going to be uh is going to be lost to space whereas earth you know we're lucky we've got this uh magnetosphere that's that protects us it also i think shows that even a planet that we think of as being dead you know mars has stopped its internal rotation it doesn't have any magnetic field or anything like that we we think of it as just being weird, a, yeah. a dead lump of uh, planet, basically. But it shows that it's still got this extremely complicated stuff going on with the ionosphere and all of that. It's, it's nothing's ever as simple as you would think, I guess, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Well, not, I mean, it's, it's not the topic of this, this particular story, but I, that by the same token, I think the dynamics at play on Venus are intriguing too because... It's a, it's a world that's believed not to have um, ongoing um, tectonic activity, um, but it still has an incredibly thick atmosphere, um, which, is, which is largely because of uh, volcanism that occurred in the past. Um, so its atmosphere over time could well change um, as its interaction with the solar wind might, um, might impact it and start stripping part of the atmosphere off so although it's you know incredibly inhospitable now um uh, i'm very interested to know more about what its future may hold mm. give it a few billion years who knows yeah a few billion years <laughs> yeah i'll I'll, uh, I'll set a, an alarm on my phone <laughs> on your cryopod <laughs> <laughs> all right um penny when we think of 3d printing stem cells and growing artificial organs it's usually in the context of transplants and trying to build replacement tissue and organs. But Maria Cheng has written a really fantastic article for the Associated Press that looks at how building mini organs that are the size of a pencil point can be used for a lot more, like determining which drug will be most effective against cystic fibrosis, for example. Yeah, I thought this was fascinating because... Well, I think like a lot of us, when I read the headline, which was, oh, I think it was um, lab-made mini organs helping doc doctors treat cystic fibrosis, I thought, what? They've made miniature lungs and the, <laughs> the miniature, you know? But what this sort actually of. is, is a bit more elegant than that. Um, cystic fibrosis is a pretty horrible disease. It's a um, genetic disease, a change in a single gene, and essentially – the mucus that is made is just really, really thick and sticky, which if you think about it, most of our internal body surfaces are lined with mucus. So, for example, our lungs um, are lined with a mucus membrane. And if that is really thick and sticky, then it gets incredibly hard to breathe. So people can have a lung transplant or there's also certain um, treatments that can be used to help people with cystic fibrosis have a better quality of life. But like many things in medicine, these treatments can be expensive. Um, you know, new drugs that are developed are not, not cheap. Um, they can also be ineffective. Like it's just because it's a one gene doesn't mean it's always the same mutation and the same um, like cause of the problem or the same manifestation in every patient. So it's very possible that someone could have a very expensive um, treatment that may not work for them and someone else that it would have worked for might miss out. Or even just that the, you know, the, the it's it sounds horrible, but, I mean, it is economic that an expensive treatment that is ineffective could have been used so much more effectively elsewhere. So it, this is where this research comes in. It's not a miniature um, lung, but essentially a miniature gut, the size of a pencil point, so really, really, really small. And this gut was grown by taking a sample of um, stem cells in the gut and growing them in essentially little Petri dishes. So these guts are apparently complete. They don't have muscles. They don't have blood vessels, but they do have everything you would expect to see in a real gut on a small scale, but they also um, mimic certain features of the full-size organs. And the way it's used in um, in cystic fibrosis research is you can actually, or it, it's actually possible to test different drugs on these mini guts um, 
to see if the pa- if it will actually work for that patient. That's so, so essentially, cool. that is so cool. And I just you just think about all the applications, like especially because I mean I don't know about these cystic fibrosis drugs, but I know that a lot of treatments people take, you know, have mm. side effects that you you don't want to undergo that unless you know it's going to work. So again, this is something like that I feel is in a way so obvious. Like if you can grow a little gut or a little body sample outside the body, yeah, why just go to transplant? Why not do something else with it? So I think this is really, really exciting. Um, I can sort of imagine researchers with, you know, a Petri dish that might have 10 or 20 copies of a patient's uh, organs or something all lined up and you'll test you know a drop of each different drug to see which one has the right effect on it you could accelerate and streamline that diagnostic process so much uh, better it'd be great yeah and apparently in the netherlands where this research was done there's about 1500 cystic fibrosis patients and these mini guts have been grown already for 450 of them so it would really be like you can see how not just on the individual scale but for um, the hospital system as a whole, the health system as a whole. Mm. The thing I immediately thought of is, oh, wouldn't this be great for cancer mm-hmm. um, if you could grow a little tumour and then test drugs on it to see what's going to be effective because I don't know a lot about chemo but I get the impression it's sometimes a bit hit and miss, like you don't always know what's going to work on that particular cancer in that particular yeah. patient. According to what I read, unfortunately, it's still a while off there. Growing a cancer is more um, more difficult to grow outside, and also you would have to be really quick with cancer. Whereas with cystic fibrosis, you know, you have time to right. to do this. But I don't know. Like sometimes I feel that everything we talk about on Science and Clock Talk <laughs> is well, it's it, it's it's either space based or if it's earth based, it's a bit doom and gloom. But I don't know. This this is a very positive story, I think. And it's something you could easily take for granted, like in 50 years. Oh, yeah, you know, just found out exactly which drugs I need to take. And mm. Well, it's something that I think we've sort of talked about from time to time, that sort of hyper-individualized healthcare, mm. which mm. is I've got a bacterial infection. So rather than give me broad fac- uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, let's find out exactly what type of bacteria you've got and exactly yeah. what antibiotic will kill just that. And mm. the same for uh, genetic disorders and other things. If you can target the uh, disease precisely, you minimise the yeah. side effects, you uh, maximise the treatment benefits. Uh, it's where we need to be heading, but of course it's the expensive approach as well and it's uh, often time-consuming. So, but yeah, that's hey. what I thought was interesting about this is in a way it's it's cheaper to do this mm. than it is to just give that particular medic uh, you know particular medicine. Yeah. And so, quicker as well because you're not mm. trying it on the patient seeing how yeah. it goes after a few weeks or whatever. You can do it multiple options at a time. Very very cool. Very exciting. And speaking of exciting, Lucas, there's yet another theory to explain the strange dimming patterns that we've observed from KIC8462852, or as it's more commonly known, Tabby Star, or as it's even more commonly known, the star with the alien megastructure that's definitely a Dyson sphere. Come on, we all know it is. I was going to say, Ed, is that the star that's... (laughs) It's also known as the WTF star. Yeah, it is. Which is, what's the flux? Of course. Of course, not anything else, just definitely the flux, yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, so what's this latest theory all about then? Well, this has been proposed as a mechanism at play before, but what's different here is that um, there's some modelling that shows that it's uh, exactly how it could work. And the the, um, hypothesis here is that a, a ringed planet transiting Tabby's star with a uh, tilted ring um, uh, configuration could actually lead to very much the same signals as have been picked up in terms of the light curve and the the change in the light uh, in front of the star, Um, which is pretty cool because, you know, as much as you can propose potential um, mechanisms to it to explain the observations, what you really want is some mathematical modelling that can 
uh, result in as close as possible to what you've seen in real life rather than you know just just wild ass guesses wild ass guesses is a good place to start i mean that's kind of like a brain brainstorm but uh, uh this is uh this is a, a a whole new level of that so i became aware whilst reading a, uh, this story of a new term i had not heard before which makes perfect sense but hadn't heard the term exo rings before um anyone has it a guess as to what an exo ring is oh but it sounds uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so exo rings are basically just rings around exoplanets. Uh, why not? Oh, so I God. guess I guess you could stick exo in front of every single characteristic of a, an exoplanet, and say it has an exo atmosphere, it has exo life forms, it has exo moons, you know, exo moons. There's no exo moon. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> So exo exo rings. Um, so as I say, you know this this really was uh, primarily a, a, a modelling study based on what I, I read. Um, and if you were to place a sort of a Saturnian like um, uh, planet on a very close orbit with the star, like think sort of point one mm-hmm. AU, so really really close to the star, then um, its apparent size compared to the star would be enough that even its rings would cause some occultation of the star and thus a dip in in light. And, you know, if you think of something like Saturn, which has incredibly large rings mm. um, uh, or years, as, uh, as it was originally thought, um, uh, then, you know, that this, is, this kind of makes a little bit of sense. And, and I've, I've some of my favourite uh, desktop wallpapers, uh, which I've got this you know, constantly changing backgrounds, mm-hmm. which are mainly Hubble images and things like that. Mm-hmm. But I've also got a massive amount of uh, Cassini images mm-hmm. um, from, from the backlit ring systems and the shadows and the contrasts that are made um, by the ring system as it, as it uh, creates shadows over Saturn because of the, the angle of the star and so forth. And, you know, that, that gives you an idea of just how much light they're capable of blocking. Mm. Um, and also how much light they're capable of reflecting uh, if it's on the other side. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, they also propose, they further propose that this mechanism could actually explain some of the other currently not fully understood light curves that they've seen around other stars, uh, which is kind of cool. So it, as they said, that basically these other, other teams that have discovered other exoplanets with slightly bizarre um, uh, light signatures maybe discovered ringed planets. They just didn't know it. So that, mm. that's also pretty cool. So I guess when you say that the rings are tilted, they'd almost have to be completely on its side, sort of like Uranus, where, which is flipped. Um, so its rings go vertically almost, as opposed to in line with the elliptical plane. But obviously yeah. we, don't, we don't really know what orbit direction uh, Tabby's star goes at. Yes. Uh, but, so depending uh, on how rings are formed... If rings are formed by, um, for example, maybe interactions between moons, maybe moons might collide together around um, a planet, then you would expect that those moons, if they formed with the planet, would be on the same, um, uh, the same orbital plane as the planet because that tends to be how things form. They, you know, they, that's why all our planets that are called planets, not planetoids, um, you know, all of the other... Uh, names that they now have Kuiper Belt, whatever the Checks. freaking <laughs> Kuiper Belt stuff. objects, yes, yeah, and all the uh, what, what's the Oort what's cloud. the new I want to be a planet, but I'm not characterization. I can't remember. Dwarf I'm planets, talking. minor planets, dwarf planets. That's it. Yeah, yes, dwarf planets. <laughs> um, I'm not a planet, but anyway, I want to yeah, be a so planet. So anything that's that's still called a planet in our in our um, our star system, which is called solar because it's Sol, that's our planet. God, it annoys me when I read stories that they talk about the solar systems, other solar systems. There aren't. It's ours. It's ours. Ours is the solar system. Sorry, I think there should be other star system. systems. Yeah, yes, yeah, star mm. systems. Exactly. Anyway, um, <laughs> I think that's being yeah, a little so bit. Yeah, so all of our planets are on the same orbital plane, um, and and across the sky they're in a line which is called the plane of the ecliptic, so or an arc, I should say. So. Um, you would expect that uh, rings would be on a, on a similar orientation if they had formed that way. But there's a whole lot of ways you can form rings. And basically, you know, collisions that can occur between trapped objects. Um, we've also got even some of our planets are not, um, you know, not orbiting in the same 
uh, plane as you would expect. Some are completely upside down. So, you know, it's there's all sorts of weird things that could happen that could cause a ring system to be inclined or some sort of, um, you know, um, op you know, not not lined up with the with the uh, ecliptic, and Saturn's like that too. So, you know, there's there's lots of reasons it could be that way. Um, they also were talking about, and I actually found this pretty cool, that if the if a ringed planet such as Saturn were close enough, like around that point one AU, an AU being, by the way, the um, an astronomical unit, which is the, the the measurement of the Earth's average orbital distance from the Sun, so 0.1, 10% of the Earth's distance from the Sun on average is where this planet could, you know, could potentially be. And if that were the case, then the star itself would have some gravitational effects on the rings. So you could end up with warping of the rings, the stretching of the actual ring systems. Imagine that. That'd be cool. <laughs> That'd be really cool. Plus, if it's that much closer, it's going to be going that much faster. It's going to be spinning around really quickly. So Well, that's why they were saying as well, you could see you know, multiple um, transits of that planet within a very short time. Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons a lot of the planets we've found are very close into their stars is because this particular method, the transit method, requires multiple detections in order to be able to say, okay, that's a planet. We've seen the same light signature or light dip occur multiple times. Therefore, we can say that this planet has just done two, three, four orbits, however many detections there have been, uh, because it's exactly the same signature that keeps occurring. But you, you put a, a tilted ring system in the equation, which means that the ring system uh, plane can be in different positions, different orientations each time it goes around. That will actually change the light curve. So, you know, you end up with a crazy kind of measurement. And also, as I say, you would, you would see, as we did see with these... Um, um, you know, this, this light detections from Tabby Star, you'd see a, a slight dip as the rings would, would, would eclipse the, the, the side of the, the star first, and then you'd see a much greater dip in light as the planet gets in front of it, and then it would drop away again, and then, you, you know, as the other side of the rings cross over. But it wouldn't necessarily be the same every time it goes around. So, it, you know, if you, it, it's actually quite a nice, neat um, description of, of what could be causing this. Very cool. Well, uh, I think it's but not exciting, aliens. But I look forward well, to the next theory that comes up to explain it, which we'll talk about in a few months' time. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, we're on the verge of uh, new discoveries, so there's going to be lots of new theories cropping up and explanations and modelling. It's good. It's what science is all about. And on that note, I think we're finished. So all the links to the stories we talked about are in the show notes and on the web, scienceontop.com slash 276. Let us know what you think. Get in touch with us on social media. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or join the likes of Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Josh Kingston Lee and others who have donated to us on Patreon. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledge for... Uh, however much you want per episode we really appreciate that it helps us keep on doing what we do love thanks you for... people thank you <laughs> thanks for joining us today penny and lucas thank you you're welcome this episode was edited with teeny tiny mini organs by marcos benamu thank you everyone for listening we'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda join us then There's a lot of risk associated with Falcon Heavy. Real good chance that that vehicle does not make it to orbit. Um, when I make sure, set expectations accordingly. Um, I hope I hope it makes it pass, you know far enough away from the pad that it does not cause pad damage. I would consider even that a win, to be honest. Um, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, very excited major pucker factor really yeah. it's like another way to describe it um, you know that, window, that, that dwindles the amount of people who want to ride on that the first time yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>